Happy Thursday, everybody. Thank you for pulling into the Pit Stop this afternoon. The Pit Stop is a place of power, influence, and transformation. I'm your host, Dr. Billy Boyd Cox, and we're in for an exciting time on today. I'm just excited to share with you what the Lord has given for us as we continue to talk about License to Dream. But we'll have a different topic on today, but I'm glad that you're here. I look forward to our Thursday afternoons together, and I pray that you were blessed from last week's uh, uh, broadcast of the Pit Stop, and this week will be no less. I'm delighted that you are here. We know that when you come to the Pit Stop, if you've ever been to a racetrack that cars pull into the pit stop when they have issues. And so here we are today again to deal with the issues that are before us. And so again, I'm grateful that you are here looking forward to what the Lord is going to share with us today. Let's jump right in. On last week, we let, we left off talking about a man by the name of Joseph from the book of Genesis in the Bible. We were at, I believe, chapter number 37 or thereabout. We covered several chapters and we were talking about Joseph because Joseph was a young boy. He was a dreamer. He had a couple of dreams and because he was a dreamer, his brothers hated him and they did some despicable things to him. They uh, talked about him. They planned to kill him and um, then one brother had a somewhat little bit of compassion on him and decided that they needed to sell him into slavery and trick their father, making their father think that he was dead. And so these things did take place and they sold Joseph into slavery. And um, if you have opportunity, go back and look, listen to last week's broadcast. You can find it on YouTube um, as well. I did post on YouTube, but Joseph, we left off last week with Joseph being in jail and Joseph spent like uh, that Joseph was in slavery and he spent two years in the prison of Pharaoh. He was once serving in the palace. Uh, we, he went from the pit to slavery to the palace. He got promoted in the palace. And then um, uh, Pharaoh's wife, the king of Egypt's wife, played a, a, a dirty trick on him. She wanted to, to be with him and he did not want to be with her. And so um, she uh, devised a plan to try to trick him into sleeping with her and he was able to get away, but she held on to a piece of his clothing and convinced the king and those uh, in the palace that Joseph had tried to come on to her. And so he was put in prison for something that he did not do. Have you ever been made to feel guilty knowing that you did not do what the person said that you did or thought that you did, but anyway, you suffered the consequences because somebody else's act, because of somebody else's actions? Well, this is what happened to Joseph. And so Joseph finds himself from the pit to slavery, from the slavery into the palace, from the palace to a promotion, and from the promotion to prison, from the promotion to punishment, from punishment to prison. And so this is where we'll jump off today. Joseph is now in prison and he and he's given favor. God has given him grace and favor, even in the prison environment. Wherever you go, no matter what you do, as long as you as long as you're trusting God, as long as you're believing in God, God will 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 make a way for you. He'll give you grace. He'll give you mercy. He'll give you favor, even in the most unlikely places. What what is favorable about being in prison? Well, in the prison, though he was he was in, on punishment in the prison, he was still had grace and favor with the guards of the prison, and so he got to do some other things. He did. He wasn't just confined to a single place. He was actually a servant in the prisons. How about that? You go from the pit to the palace to uh, promotion to punishment and now you're in the prison and you're getting to serve in the prison. That's a kind of double bondage. Anybody ever been in a situation where you found yourself doubly bound? So here in the text today, I want to start out at chapter number 40, and then I'm going to jump around so that we can cover everything. Chapter number 40 says, it came to pass that after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king, and Pharaoh was wroth against his two officers the chief butler and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in the ward in the house of the captain of the guard and into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. The captain of the guard uh, charged Joseph with them. And so here Joseph is in the prison, still has a dream, but he's in prison now. He still has a dream and he's now in charge of serving these two people who have offended the king of Egypt. And so Joseph is a servant in, in the prison. He's a servant in the prison. Uh, and these two people had dreams and uh, one of them dreamed uh, one thing and another one dreamed the other thing. And they were perplexed. And when Joseph went in to serve them, he looked at them and said that there was something 
something different about them? How is it that you can find yourself in the most undesirable situation, but you still have compassion. You're still able to identify with the aches and pains of others that you're, you're still concerned about somebody other than yourself. That's how Joseph gets this grace and favor because his thoughts and his concerns are not always to himself. They're about other people because he's surrounded by other prisoners. And so he asked these two, the chief butler and the chief uh, baker, what's, what's wrong? Why are you sad today? Why is the countenance on your face sad? And sometimes we look at people and we can tell that there's something going on in their lives. If we just take a moment sometimes to just stop and be mindful of other people and take our eyes off of our own issues sometimes, there's a way for God to get the glory from our lives, even if in the midst of dire situations. And so here we find that Joseph is asking them and they say to him, we have dreamed a dream and no man is here to interpret it. And Joseph says to them, he says, do not interpretations belong to God. He said, tell me them and I, I he said, tell me them, I pray you. And they began to tell Joseph their dream. And one, one person had a dream about a vine and three branches and the blossoms and, and uh, ripe fruit. And Joseph interpreted the dream to tell him that in three days that he was going to be the king's cupbearer again, that he would be taken out of prison. And the other person had a dream about birds being on the head and, and plucking, eating something off of the head and that person's dream. And I, I invite you to go and read chapter 40. I'm just trying to paraphrase to get us to a place today. Read Genesis chapter 40 uh, and when you have time so that you can follow along with me and you can see exactly what I'm talking about. But here in the text, Joseph interprets the dream. One man's uh, uh, interpretation is that he will live, that Pharaoh will restore him in three days. And the other man's interpretation is that he will die. And in three days, Pharaoh will have him killed. And this is exactly what happened because on the third day, it was Pharaoh's birthday. And he sent for the chief baker and he sent for the chief butler and brought them before him. And he, he restored one and killed the other one. And Joseph only asked them when they were being released to the when they were being released to go back and serve in the palace when they were being put back in their place or restored to their proper places of service within the palace he said remember me he says remember me and then it came to pass that two years later nobody had remembered that Joseph was the one who interpreted the dream but Joseph didn't complain about it see sometimes when we have dreams and we have visions and we have hopes and desires we spend a lot of time complaining we start focusing on on complaining about what is not happening in our lives. And I want us to understand that no matter how long you've had this dream, because you still have a license to dream again, no matter how long you've had this dream, you that dream is still going to take place in your life, even though you're coming through some rough places to get there. Joseph is doing nothing to manifest a dream other than being the servant, being kind to people. He's doing nothing. See, sometimes we want our dreams to happen when we want them to happen. And sometimes we want things to take place when we want them to take place. And sometimes we want things to move at the rate that we want them to move at. And that is not always the case. Sometimes we have to wait on God all the time. We have to wait on God. We can't move forward and do the things that we want to do when we want to do them. We have to be about our father's business. And we have to make sure that as we are about our father's business, that we are also mindful of other people, that we are mindful that we don't stop doing the work of ministry, that we don't stop doing the work of serving other people, that we don't stop extending grace to others, that we don't stop movement because sometimes we get stuck in our own ways. We get stuck in our own stuff and we're not able to progress and we're not able to move forward because we begin to we begin to focus on what's not happening in our lives instead of focusing on what is taking place in our lives. Because even, even if you find yourself in prison, even if you find yourself in an undesirable situation, even if you find yourself in a wilderness, in a dry, in a barren place, even if you find yourself in jail, in prison, in the hospital, somewhere other than where you would want to be, you are still blessed because you are still alive and your dream and the vision and the plan that God has for your life is still going to 
to come to pass, but you've got to refocus and reshift your attention so that you're not focused on what is not happening in your life so that your focus is on what is good about your life. Because if we look and we don't have to look real hard, sometimes you will find something that is good about your life, something that is healthy about your life, something that is joyful about your life, something that is peaceful about your life. You'll have a reason to praise God. You'll have a reason to lift your hands. You'll have a reason to say, thank you, Jesus. You'll have a reason to just bless God. You'll have a reason to want to continue on this journey, even though it does not look like what you thought it would look like, even though your dreams may have been years in the making and you still have not reached that desired place, though they have not manifested in your life. If you keep on living, if you keep on serving, if you keep on loving, if you keep on moving in the right way, if you don't be, if you stop being judgmental, if you stop being critical, if you stop focusing on the negative things and ask God to surround you with some people who can pour some positive energy into you that will help you refocus and reshift yourself. Uh, you will find yourself even in the midst of all of this because sometimes we go through trials and tribulations to get us where God would have us to be. There's a strengthening. Sometimes we'll, we ask God and particularly I'm, I'm going to speak for myself. We ask God to strengthen us when we're praying and we're talking to God. We say, God, strengthen me for today. When in order to be strengthened, you have to be stretched. And sometimes our dark places, our prisons, the place that have us bound. Sometimes those dark places are stress, stretching us and strengthening us for the journey that is ahead. Sometimes it's, there's an experience, there's a teaching there for us, for us. There's something there that we need to glean from so that we can go forward and do the things that we have been assigned to do. Well, here we find Joseph two, two years later, still in prison and all, all God, God works things out for our good. He works things out for our good because here two years later, Pharaoh has a dream and there is, he's surrounded by all of these astrologers and sorcerers and soothsayers and all of these other people who are supposed to be able to interpret dreams and nobody can interpret his dreams. He has a dream about uh, seven, uh, seven kinds that were well favored. Uh, cattle. And he had a, a dream about uh, some lean kinds that came up and ate up the healthy ones. And so, uh, and I'm in chapter number 41 now talking about Pharaoh's dream and he didn't understand what it meant. And he went to sl sleep a second time and he dreamed something else about seven ears of corn that came up on one stalk and they were good. And then he dreamed about seven ears of thin corn uh, that uh, that black that the east wind sprung up after them and blasted them and that the thin ears of corn devoured the the full ears of corn and he did not understand this thing perplexed him and there was nobody to interpret the dream and all of a sudden in verse number nine of chapter chapter 41 in the book of Genesis the chief butler the one who lived the one who's Joseph who Joseph interpreted his dream and said hey remember me when you get back to Pharaoh's house remember me when you're in the palace Two years later, two year, two full years later, while Joseph is still in the prison, this butler says to this butler says to Pharaoh, I do remember my faults to this day. He said, You were mad with me, and I'm paraphrasing. He said, You were mad with me, and you put me in with the captain of the house of the guard, both me and the chief baker. And he told him, he said, and we dreamed a dream. And there was uh there was a, a young man there, one of the Hebrews, a servant to the captain of the guard, and he and we told him our dreams, and he interpreted our dreams for us, and each man according to his dream did he he interpret and it came to pass that he interpreted for us what I want to let you know that your gift will make room for you your gift will make room for you Joseph was a dreamer he dreamed and his dream had not yet come to pass but it's on its way it's on its way and all Joseph is doing is being Joseph being kind being good being honorable serving He's serving and his, and God is making room for his dream, for his, for his gift. He's making room for his gift while he is serving, while he's in an undesirable place. God is making room for his gift. He brought to remembrance that, that there was an interpreter who interpreted the dream. He brought to the remembrance of the chief butler to say, oh, I do remember when I, when you were mad with me, King, that there was somebody in prison with me who had a dream. We had a dream and he interpreted our 
our dream. God will make room for your gift. And so Pharaoh said in verse number 14, the Bible says that Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon and he shaved himself and cleaned himself up and came into Pharaoh. Not only will God make room for your gift, but God will send for you wherever you are. He will send for you and he'll give you an opportunity to be cleaned up and presented before people who are in high places. God will make room for your gift. And so Joseph came and Pharaoh told Joseph his dreams and Joseph interpret. He, he, he asked God for the interpretation and God gave him the interpretation of Pharaoh's dream. And, and not only will God make room for your gifts, but God will also send somebody for you and then he will bless you because exactly the exact interpretation of the dream Pharaoh blessed Joseph because nobody else had been able to interpret. He told him that these seven years ago, that there's going to become a famine upon the land and that there are going to be seven good years and then there are going to be seven bad years, seven rough years. And so he made Joseph head over everything he had. He made him an overseer. So this same man who, whose brothers hated him, whose brothers sought to kill him, whose brothers plotted and planned to kill him, whose brother put, whose brothers put him in the pit, whose brothers rescued him from the pit and sold him into slavery, who found himself serving in Pharaoh's house, who, who was promoted in Pharaoh's house, who received promotion in Pharaoh's house, who was, who was put in prison in Pharaoh's house, has now been sent for, who has now been promoted as the overseer over everything. Nobody in the land could do anything except they went through Joseph and Joseph gave them permission. And Joseph was a strategist. God gave him the ability to be strategic. And I want us to understand today that just like God gave Joseph the ability to be strategic, that we are also strategic. You are strategic. You just have to give yourself some time to think through some things, to plan out some things, to reconsider some things. Sometimes we are more reactive to stuff than we are being proactive to it. And reactive cause you to act in a rapid response to a situation that may not be the best response for it, but being proactive cause you to be still. The Bible tells us be still and see the salvation of the Lord. Be still. Sometimes we just need to be still and put a plan in place to strategize how this is going to look, to strategize. And so here Joseph was the overseer of everything that Pharaoh had. Not only did Joseph get promoted, not only did he, did he become the, the overseer over everything that Pharaoh had, but Pharaoh also took off his ring and gave it to him. He gave him fine clothes. He arrayed him in fine linen, gave him gold chains around his neck, made him ride in the chariot that was right behind. He was second in line to Pharaoh. So this is a real kind of elevation, though he is still a slave in Pharaoh's house. He's now an overseer. He has a different position, a different promotion, and he's able to be seen and function in different ways. He's right riding in the chariot right behind the king of Egypt. He's in the second chariot. God will elevate you even in the midst of dire situations. God will elevate you. He will promote you. He will put you in a place that nobody can move you from. He will elevate you though your dream is not yet manifested. You keep waiting on the dream, but ride the ride that takes you to the dream. Get in the cart that's taking you to the dream. Get in the cart and ride the ride that is taking you to your dream. Don't, don't kick against the fact that your dream has not manifested itself yet. It's not gone. It's not forgotten because nothing can stop a move of God, but ride the joy ride that the Lord is placing in front of you. Now ride the joy ride that is yours to ride. Know that God still has a plan and nobody can abort the plan of God on your life because God will make room for your gifts. He'll make room for your gifts. And here, not only has he been arrayed with, with fine jewelry with fine clothing. Not only has he been given a new title and a new place to ride when he, and, and a new chariot to ride in when they're out in the, in the highways, in their, in their priestly, in their, in their kingsly parades and everything. But also Pharaoh does something particularly unique. He gives Joseph, he thinks so highly of Joseph that he gives Joseph his daughter to wife. He, he gives Joseph his daughter. He gives Joseph, uh, not his daughter, but 
Pharaoh called Joseph and he gave him a different name and he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On. He gave him a wife. He gave him not his daughter, but the daughter of one of the priests. He gave him a, a, a woman. He gave him a wife. And Joseph was over all of the land of Egypt. And when all of this took place, Joseph was 30 years old. The stuff happened when Joseph was a teenager, but now Joseph is 30 years old and all of this stuff is now manifesting. Some Sometimes when we have dreams and visions and hopes and desires, we think that they're supposed to happen immediately. We think that they're supposed to take place the same day. We think that they're supposed to take place just because we had the dream last night that we're supposed to wake up and the dream has manifested itself, but that is not so. There's a time and a season for everything under the heaven. Ecclesiastes 3 uh, verse number one, there's a time and a season and God's time is always perfect. It's always right because God knows what we can handle and when we can actually handle it. See, sometimes we're not prepared. Sometimes we're not. God called me to preach at a later stage in life. He called me to pastor at a later stage in life because in my younger years, in my 20, I wasn't prepared to minister to people. I wasn't, I wasn't who I am today. I wasn't prepared and I may have done damage to people. So God knows what God wants to do with our lives and at exact what time we're supposed to start walking in what God has called us to do. And he here at 30 years of age, Joseph finds himself over everything in the land of Egypt. He's been blessed. He's been given a wife. He's been given all of these riches and nobody in Egypt can do anything without it going through Joseph first. They don't get to go to Pharaoh, to the king of Egypt. They don't get to run to him and get their stuff heard. They've got to go to Joseph because now this there's seven plenteous years in the land and Joseph has devised a plan. I talked to you a few minutes ago about being strategic. Joseph has devised a plan how the famine won't take won't hurt the king of Egypt how they are able to store up and how they're able to prosper because the famine is coming and so Joseph has devised a plan he's been strategic in in devising this plan where the king of Egypt is going to come out on top he's going to be looking like pure gold Joseph is still serving he's still blessing somebody else he's not taking anything for himself he's still blessing somebody else he's not doing anything to harm anybody else. He's still doing the job that he has been assigned to do. He's doing exactly what he's been assigned to do. Still a prisoner in, in Pharaoh's kingdom. Still a prisoner, but he's a prisoner who's been promoted. He's a prisoner who's been blessed. He's a prisoner who has now who, who now has power, prestige, and position. Sometimes even in a dark place, God will give you power, prestige, and position. You just got to know what to do with it once you get it and not let it go to your head. We've got to know how to process it, how to make it bless everybody with whom we have to do. He's in a place where he has power, prestige, and position. His dream has not manifested itself yet, but he's on his way there. He's on his way there. He's not doing anything himself other than being who God created him to be. That's all that he's doing is being who God created him to be, and he's on his way to the dream. He's on his way there, and on his way there, he has a, he has he has come from the pit to to the palace to prison uh and now he's he's been promoted once again and he has this place of power prestige and position and he's over everything that has to do with anything in the land of Egypt he is he's the he's the the high baller and the shot caller, if you want to call it that. He's, he's the one that, that everybody has to go to to get everything done, but he does not let that, he doesn't gloat on it. He doesn't, he's not prideful about it. He's still a servant. He's still a servant, though he is not, free. he's not bondage. He has this power, this prestige and position, but he's still a servant. And if we learn how to serve while we're being blessed, even in dark places, in weary places, in trying places, in places where things just aren't the way that we want them to be. If we learn how to function in those places, if we learn how to receive in those places, because sometimes you have to have a heart to receive what God is giving you, even though he's given it to you in a place that you have no desire to be. When you're on a job and you get a promotion on a job that you really hate and you don't want to be there, but somebody sees something in you and blesses you with a promotion, you got to learn how to receive that promotion with joy so that whenever 
so that whatever you do, you're able to do it from a different perspective. You might hate the job, but love what you're doing. Love, love, love how it makes you feel that you've got, you've been identified that now you have promotion. Now you have promotion and you're able to be a blessing to other people around you. Work the work that is before you. Ask God to bless the works, to establish the works of your hand. Work the work that is before you. Do what's before you, even though you might have to do it in a place that you despise, in a place that is undesirable to you, in a place that is not your home, in a place that is not where you want to be. Go through what you got to go through so you can grow through what you're going through because every experience in your life is preparing you for something. Whether that experience is good or bad or indifferent, it's preparing you for something. There's a lesson to be learned from every experience. It took me a long time to learn those things. It took me a long time to learn that uh, even if I'm faced with rejection, there's something to learn from being faced with rejection. Even if I'm faced with disappointment, there's something to learn from disappointment. There's something to learn when my feelings are hurt. There's something to learn when you're angry. There's a lesson to be learned in every experience that we encounter and we have to position ourselves and rethink some things and refocus and strategize on some things, not trying to overthink God or not trying to overthink people, but say, okay, God, I'm going through this. And this is because sometimes life takes us in a circle. We are, we become secular, secular beings. We go in around and around circular beings. We go around and around and around on a merry-go-round. And we're like, God, why does this keep happening? It keeps happening because we've not learned the lesson from the first time or the second time. And so it keeps happening because we keep doing the same things. It might be with different people, but the patterns, the habits are the same. We keep doing the same things. And until we look at what we're doing and how we process things and how things uh, happen every time we do this certain thing, what the outcome is, because it's always the same. And we always end up with the short end of the stick until we begin to reflect on those things because sometimes life will require us to stop and reflect on some things. When you begin to reflect on the things that you find that are bitter to you and that cause you to be broken, when you begin to reflect on them and start thinking, what can you do different? Because sometimes we blame other people. We blame what our mamas didn't do. We start talking about if our daddy had done this, if he hadn't broken my heart, if she hadn't broken my heart if she hadn't done this we start blaming other people but we don't hear Joseph blaming his brothers for his predicament we don't hear Joseph blaming anybody we don't hear Joseph blaming his father for sending him out to go find his brothers in the first place we don't hear Joseph blaming and so sometimes it causes us to sit back and reflect how did I end up like this anyway how did this happen and why does this keep happening to me these are rhetorical questions that you need to answer for yourself you know, take some paper out, get, get a pen or a pencil and start sitting down saying, okay, okay, God, I am in the same place I was this time last year. What should I have done differently? What could I have done differently? And why do I keep doing the same things over and over and be still for a minute and listen to yourself breathe and begin to write down whatever you hear, and whatever you feel, but write down your role in it. Because sometimes we blame other people, particularly when we were kids. And if our parents didn't do what we thought that they should have done, if we weren't raised in a, in a two parent household with two incomes and, you know, we didn't have the best of this or the best of that, we start blaming them for what they did not do for us. But after you come of a certain age, Age, after you're an adult, you're able to change whatever it is, whatever you thought you lacked in life. You're able to re-strategize your life so that you can come out on top so that you don't repeat the same life cycle that your parents repeated with you. Because most of the time our parents do what they know to do and they do what, what they think is best for us. It may not be the best. It absolutely may not be the best. I grew up in an environment where I, I had a step parent and my step parent was abusive. Uh, and, and 
and and and and you know, and I was able to forgive that step parent for the abuse. I I don't sit around and blame anybody because I'm all the better. I learned the lesson of the abusiveness. I learned the lesson. No, it wasn't something that I desired to go through. No, it was not pleasant. Did I cry many many days? I learned how to climb trees because I was trying to get away from the abuse. I learned to go sit in a magnolia tree. That's my favorite tree. I learned to climb a tree where I would not be harmed that particular day. I learned to sit in a tree and sit there for hours and reflect and think and hope and dream and wish. And I found peace sitting on the branches of a magnolia tree. Well, you have to go back and reflect and think about some things that you could do differently in your life. Though things did not happen the way that you think that they should have happened in your life, you can't hold people hostage because of that. I was talking to a young lady the other day whose children just don't talk to her that dislike her because of the way that they were brought up and they didn't like some things about her. And I was encouraging her saying, I asked her how old her children were. And she told me the ages. I said, sweetie, they don't live in your house. You've got to set some boundaries. And sometimes we go through stuff because we fail to set boundaries around our own lives. But we also need to set boundaries around our thought process so that we don't linger in our past because lingering in your past will keep you from getting to your future, lingering over something that you have no ability to go back and change lingering. We don't find Joseph lingering. We find Joseph being progressive. He's moving forward. Though his situation is absolutely not the most desirable situation, he is not lingering. He's not sitting around longing to go back and, and talk to his brothers and, and fuss his brothers out because of what they did to him. That is not what Joseph is doing. We see Joseph progressing. God is moving him forward and God moves us forward even in the midst of ugly situations. And you've got to sit back and reflect and ask yourself these questions. What is it that I need to do from this point forward? I don't want to live like this. I don't want to do this anymore. What is it that I need to, what's the lesson that I have missed all of these years? What's the lesson that I need to apply to my life right now so that it can be better going forward so that my ladder can be, can be so, so that my grade, my ladder can be greater than my past so that I'm not dwelling on what happened yesterday or last year or 10 years ago or when I was eight or when I was nine. And I'm not, some of us grew up in some horrific situations. I'm not talking about you getting, forgetting that you were molested or that you were raped. I'm not talking about you forgetting those things. I'm talking about how you heal from those things and how you move forward from those things and how you give voice to the, to the pain and to the hurt so that your healing process can be heard, can, can, can begin so that your healing process can begin. I know that some of us grew up in homes where we were exposed to domestic violence and all of that kind of stuff, but, but there is, there were lessons to be learned. So what's the lesson so that you can come out of the cycle of regret because regret is the thing that will hold us and keep us stuck and steady. Regret has us looking back instead of looking forward and life is meant to be lived forward. It is meant to be progressive, not digressive. It is meant to be progressive that we move forward in the things of God and we cannot move forward where we're always looking back. In the book of Genesis, there is a story there about a man by the name of Lot and Lot um, um, Lot and his wife, um, they lived in a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. And in Sodom and Gomorrah, there was all kinds of stuff going on, all kind of wickedness going on, all, all kinds of stuff. And so, uh, he had, a, he had an uncle who, who had a great relationship with the Lord and the uncle, and I'm paraphrasing again, the uncle said to, to the Lord, you know, Per, you know, perhaps there'd be one person there that, you know, that, that is doing good. Would you save them? And so the Lord honored Abraham, sent, the, sent his angels down to get Lot and his wife out. He told them, don't look back on Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot's wife looked back and Lot's wife became a pillar of salt. Why was she looking back? She was looking back, perhaps the Bible doesn't tell us why she looked, but perhaps because she left son-in-laws there. She left sons there in that place. Perhaps she was looking back to see if God was going to do what God said he was going to do. But she, she looked back longing and lingering for what was behind her and she became a pillar of salt. And some of us are pillars of salt in our minds because we keep looking back over the woulda, shoulda, couldas and hoping that 
things would, would, would have been different. They were not different, but you are different and you have the ability to make them different now. You have the ability to make what's ahead of you different if you stop focusing on what was behind you. If you stop dwindling, dwind, uh, dwindling there and lingering there. If you stop wondering how life would have been if, if this had happened, if that had happened. If you stop wondering, oh, what would have happened if I had had this or if I could have graduated from college, what would have happened? Uh, you can graduate from college now. Colleges are still open. You're not too old to go. You may not have had the traditional path where people graduate right out of high school and go right into college, but college is still available to you. What would have happened if, if I had been able to start my business, if I had enough money to start my business? Well, start planning now, strategize how you can save some money to start a business now. Stop, do, stop dwelling on what did not happen and begin to focus on what has the potential to happen in your life. Refocus, reshift, shift, refocus so that you can uh, be strategic about how you move forward because you don't have to stay stuck. You don't have to be in the circumstance that you're in right now. If you're in a place that is undesirable, strategize. Ask God, how shall I be delivered from this place, God? How will how will this come out? Begin to ask God. Begin to talk to God. We don't have to be on our knees or laying prostrate before the Lord to have a conversation. You can talk to God if you're a dishwasher in a restaurant. You can every plate, every spoon. You can talk to God while you are washing dishes. You can talk to God while you're sweeping floors, while you're cleaning the bathroom, while you're the CEO in somebody else's company. You can talk to God wherever you are and just begin to ask God questions. You 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 just began to talk to him and say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm so tired. God, I, I'm weary and I'm tired and I, I have anxiety and I, God, I just need you to do something different, Lord God. I need to do something different, but I don't know what to do because I've done this thing right here for so long, God, and nothing has turned out well for me, Father. So I need you now, God, to, to open my eyes and help me to see differently, God. I need you to open my ears, God, that I might hear you differently, Lord God. I need you, God, to open my heart that I might receive different. God, I need you to to establish the works of my hand, God, so that I don't feel like I'm not accomplishing anything. God, God I need you to activate my dream because this is what this text is all about. It's about act activating your dream. Don't let it, don't let your dream die. Giving yourself permission to dream again, knowing that it has not manifested, but that does not mean that the things you're going through is not preparing you for your dream. It, that it's not preparing you for your dream to manifest itself. It will show up because God's word cannot return to him void. It will show up. It will happen. But sometimes we've got to, as we are going through the process, we've got to change the way that we think about things. This is about the pit stop is a place of power, influence, and transformation. And what happens at the pit stop is that we begin to think differently about things because if you cannot think differently about the things that you do and the places that you uh, that you you find yourself in, if you cannot think differently about those things, you'll never begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel. You'll never begin to see your way out. And so it requires that our thought process changes and said we've got to replace the negative things around us and the negative people around us and the negative thoughts that we feed ourselves because you've you've heard some people say you know I don't you know I, I'm, I'm just so sick I'm throwing my hands up I'm, I'm just tired I don't even want to live anymore or I'm just sick of this life or I'm sick of this I'm sick of that and we speak self-fulfilling prophecy so you speak about sickness so long that you get sick or, or you you hate on stuff or you hate people or you're mean and you're you're, you're bitter about stuff and you take that out on other people, that's not going to help you get to where you need to be. Help you get to where you want to go, but you get in that place of bitterness for so long. I desire for us to be better, not bitter. He desires for us to be better, not bitter. And how do you get to be better? You begin to be better by shifting your focus, by rethinking, by, by asking God to help you think differently about things. About things. God to give you wisdom, to give you
You cannot accomplish anything without goals and a plan. You can't accomplish anything without goals and a plan. And you say, well, you're talking about Joseph. We hadn't heard that Joseph had any goals or any plans. We do know that Joseph is a servant of the Lord. And though his goals and his plans are not are not visible here, the strategy, strategy that he uses to bless somebody else is visible here. And sometimes we got to stop looking at other folks and look at our own selves. What is it that God has assigned your hands to do? What is it that he has assigned your feet? Where, where is it, has he assigned your feet to go? What is it that he has assigned your mouth to? Because you have an assignment. All of us have a God assignment. We're all assigned to do something, even if we've got to go over some mountains and through some valleys and down some by some river sides to get there. Even if we have to go through some dark places, all of us have an assignment and we need to focus on getting to that assignment. But while we're in the midst of getting to that assignment, we need to make sure that we are doing our very best to love, to treat people well, to do good to other people as we go through. Because one day you'll look up and you'll find yourself out of what you've been through. The Bible says in Psalms 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you, you're walking through it. You're not designed to stay in it. It says walk through walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. You're supposed to come out on the other end. You're supposed to come all the way through. You're not supposed to linger there. You're not supposed to stay in the valley, looking around from wall to wall, going around in a circle, treading a path and making a circle, making a trail in the valley. You're supposed to come through your past. Your trajectory is supposed to go straight in front of you unless God shifts you to the left or to the right. You're supposed to be looking ahead, not behind you. You've already come through that. I I recall in, in 2014, I was at a rough place in my life. I was very, at a very rough place emotionally. I was at a, at a really, really rough place. And one day I just said, okay, God, I've got to, I've got to get away. I need to go somewhere. And I love being near the water and I love being, being in the mountains. And so I got on, I got on the expressway. I'm here in Atlanta. And so closest expressway to me was I-20. So I got on I-20 going West, like going towards downtown. And I was like, no, I don't want to go that way. I got off and got back on I-20 going East and okay, I'll go to Myrtle beach. And then I decided I didn't want to go there. My mind was all over the place. And sometimes that happens to us is that our thoughts, are all rambled and rattled and we can't get ourselves together. And so I got back off the expressway, got back on going I-20 West again and said, okay, God, I'm going, I'm, I'm going, uh, I'm, I'm getting on 285 and I don't know if I'll end up in South Carolina. I don't know where I'll end up, but God, I just need you to take me somewhere to clear my head. I just need God. I need you to move like you've never moved before. So I'm driving in my car and I'm listening to the radio and I hear, um, I hear something on the radio that piques my interest, but I, I, I pull over at, at Kroger's at Shamley Tucker. I, I get off at Shamley Tucker. And if you're in Georgia, you know, Shamley Tucker is off 285. I get off at Shamley Tucker. I go into the Kroger's and I buy some grapes and I get some water to wash the grapes off. And I jump back in my car and I'm like, God, I don't know where I'm going. I'm just driving. I don't know where I'm going. And before I pull off again, I check my email and I see that there's a Groupon and I'm, I like, I like bargain. And I see that there's a Groupon to a place in the mountains. And so I click on that Groupon. I purchase that Groupon. I buy it. I drive to the mountains. I drive up um, in the mountains in North Georgia and I get there. And everywhere I go, every turn I make, it's like the Lord is showing me something different. I see a sign that blesses me. I see trees and they bless me. I hear something on the radio about a child who had been, um, who had been uh, a victim of a drive-by shooting, a nine-month-old baby. And I heard uh, the grandfather talk to the radio uh, announcer and he was saying that the doctors they were inquiring about the, the the health of the of the of the baby and the and the the grandfather said that the doctors had said that he had that the bullet is lodged in him but the body has decided to heal itself that the wound was healing though he had been injured that the wound was healing uh, the body had decided to heal uh, around the wound and that's what God began to speak to me that he was though my heart had been broken that he was healing me that the wound was closed my flesh was closing up over the wound and he was healing me. And so I get to, I get to, um, get to the place where I'm checking in and I get to the desk and they say, we don't have anything, um, with your name on it. And I pull up my iPad, I pull them up and I say, no, no, I just booked this about an hour ago. And I know that you have a room here for me. I've already paid for it. And she said, you look like you need to be on the top floor. And I said, I don't care where you put me, just put me somewhere. 
I get the best view. I get the best room that they had in the lodge on the top floor overlooking the valley. And I stood there and I listened as tears dropped to the carpet in the room. I could literally hear my tears falling and hitting the floor. And I looked out and I began to say, God, I wonder what's over that, I, over that, that hill right there. I wonder what's in that valley right there. God, I wonder what's around that curb because I had a magnificent view. I had a magnificent view. And I sat down and I opened the Bible and I began to read through the Psalms and I began to just read and pray and cry out to God. And I stood up again and I looked out the window again. And as I looked out the window and started saying, God, I wonder what's over there. And God spoke to me. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, don't worry about what's over there. I brought you up here to this place of elevation because what you're looking at is what you've already come through. I brought you up here to have you look in the other direction to see that I'm the same God who brought you through all of that and I will take you up to the next level. He brought me to a place and I'm looking out over where I've come through to, for God to tell me that I brought you through around the curve, over the hill, down in the valley. I brought you through all of that. I brought you up here to elevate you. This is a word for somebody. You've going, you're going through, you've been going through for a while. You've been in a rough patch, in a rough season, but I want you to know today that while you are looking back over your path, know that God has brought you all the way through, all the way around the curve, up the hill, over the hill, down in the valley. God has brought you all the way through and there is something on you, for you on the next level. You've just got to continue up the mountain to get to the next level. You've just got to continue on with God to get to the next level because there is hope for you. There is joy for you. There is peace for you. There is power for you. There is a life ahead of you though you don't have what you used to have and you may have lost some things along the wayside. God is a restore. He'll give you back the years that that the canker worm, the caterpillar, the locust, and the palmer worm has taken from you. He will restore to you. He will give to you. He will bless you. He will crown you with glory and honor. Your life is not over. This has been a dark season and a rough season, and you didn't know how you were going to come through. But I promise you that if you keep looking ahead, that God is bringing you through. Even now, Joseph was in the prison. He was still in enslavement. He was still in bondage, though he was blessed though he had it going on. And sometimes life is hard, even for people who live in the best place, who live in gated communities, who have these high power jobs. Sometimes they are still in a place of bondage. They have a mask on while they are out in public, but when they get home, they break down because life is not like they appear, like it appears to be to those who are on the outside. It's a word for somebody today. And I pray that you get this word. And if it's not for you, you know, somebody who can use this word that God is not done done with you yet. He'll make room for your gifts. He'll send for you. He'll bring you through and has brought you through what you have gone through. And now you are in a place of power, position, and prestige that God is not done with you, that there is hope. Your hope is yet alive and God's desire for you is to be better and not bitter. He took me to the mountains to show me that he was healing what was going on on the inside of me, that he was healing me from the inside out and that he had taken me through and allowed me to look out over these hills and valleys and around these curves and up these paths because he was taking me to a place of elevation. I drove up this mountain and I'm a person who was at that time afraid of heights and I'm in my car driving up this mountain and, the, and it's going higher and higher and the peak is getting steeper and steeper, but I had to continue forward. I could not stop. I did not have the option to go down the mountains the same way that I came back up them, that I came up the mountain. I needed difference. I needed a new perspective. And that night I began to dream and dream. And the Lord told me, he said, I brought you here because you're in the valley of decision. When you wake up in the morning, you have to go back down in the valley and you have to make a decision 
decision. You have to make a decision. And sometimes we don't want to do what's necessary because we don't want to make a decision. We're worried about who's going to feel some type of way about our decision. We're worried about who's not going to like it. We're so busy trying to live up to other people's expectations that we fail to live to God's expectation for us, that we fail to live our own lives or live up to our own expectations of ourselves or that we have no expectations for ourselves. But God said to me, you have to go back down in that valley and you have to make a decision. And when you make a decision, live with the decision that you have made, make a decision. And that's what this is about today. Somebody needs to know that it is time for you to stop wallowing and wondering. It is time for you to step up and make a decision. It is a time for you to take your life in the new, in a new direction. It is a time for you to begin to seek the Lord differently and stop dwelling on what did not happen in your past and stop dwelling on what has happened in your past and ask God to heal you from it and help you to move forward so that you can begin to live the life, to live into the dream that you had from a young child, to live into the vision that you have, to live, to write down your vision, write it down so that you can begin to go after it so that you can begin to move towards it and to move forward in your life. God does not mean for us to stay stuck. If God had meant for us to be one way when we came out of our mother's womb, we would have stayed babies all of our lives. But God meant for us to be progressive, for us to grow, because whatever is in us that God placed in us before we were formed in our mother's belly, whatever is in us is for somebody else. And somebody else is waiting on you so that they can get to their destiny. And they cannot get to their destiny until you began to walk out yours, until you come out of the place of self-loathing, until you come out of the place of loneliness and unforgiveness and bitterness and hatred and meanness until you come out of those places, until you begin to live your authentic self, no matter what that looks like, until you begin to be you, the you that you were created to be, until you begin Michelle Obama's book, Becoming Michelle Obama, until you learn to become who you were created to be, until you become who you were created to be, you'll forever stay in this stagnant place. You'll forever be in this dark place. You'll forever be here stuck and steady, never getting to the thing that God really created you for. You've got to give yourself permission to be authentically who you are, not no, not explaining to anybody why you are who you are, just that God has created me to be. He says that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and so that's who I am. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. It might not look like it to you, but that's who I am. And so you've got to be, begin to speak life to yourself. You have life and death and the power of your tongue. You need to begin to speak life to yourself, speak life to those around you, speak life over your children, over your grandchildren, over your nieces and nephews. You speak life because there is life left in us. If you are yet breathing, there is life left in you and God can still use you to do what he placed in you to do before you were formed in your mother's belly. God is not done with us. Joseph is still in the prison. Joseph is still working the plan that he strategized over to bless Pharaoh. Joseph has not seen his father yet, but God is bringing all of this to pass because this famine is causing his father and his brothers to have to now look for food because they're not able to feed themselves. And so his father sends the brothers into Egypt and who do they have to go to in order to get food? They have to go to their very own brother and they don't recognize Joseph because Joseph Joseph does not look like what Joseph has been through. They don't even recognize their very own brother, their brother. They don't recognize him. They have to go to him to get some food. They have to go to him to buy food. And Joseph says he, he, he recognizes them and he says, he says to them, you all look like spies. And he, he goes through this thing so that he can get them to where he is uh, and so that he can have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them. And they, he, he asks them about their, their father and if they had another brother. And he says, go back and bring your other brother here. And they say, you know, our father won't let us bring him. But anyway, they go back and they, and I'm at the end of the chapter, at the end of the book of Genesis. Uh, he go, they go back and they get the brother and they bring the brother and, and then they, Joseph sends them back and say, 
go back and get your father and bring your father here. And Joseph gets to lay his eyes on his father and he begins to weep on his father's neck. And they realize it. Joseph dreamed this dream. Joseph dreamed this dream about people bowing down. He said he had some sheaves and the sheaves bowed down to him. His brothers became his servants. They bowed down to him in Egypt. Your dream will happen whether you, when you, when you start doing the things that you need to do, your dream is going to come. It is going to come to pass the vision that the Lord has for your life. It is going to come to pass and God may allow you to go through some rough places or some decisions that you make on your own may take you through some rough places. But if you keep trusting God, if you keep believing, if you keep being good to people and treating people well and loving people, and if you give yourself permission to become who you are, who you were created to be, if you give yourself permission to move forward in the things and the power of God, God will heal you. God will rescue you. God will elevate you. God will promote you and God will bless you. But you've got to give yourself permission to be used by God to even though the you, God using you may not feel good, God will bring him, he will bring himself glory through your very own life. I want to bless God today for our time together as we wrap up today. And I pray that you have heard a word from the Lord today and that if it's not for you, that you will share it with, with somebody. Invite them to join us every Thursday on every Thursday at 5 p.m. on this broadcast 108 Praise Radio. Invite them to download the app and pull into the pit stop with your host, Dr. Billy Boyd Cox. I thank God for this lesson because as I sit here today, this lesson is even blessing me. It, it's God reminding me where God has brought me from. And it reminds me that God is not done with me yet. I was so terrified. I've wanted to do a radio broadcast forever and ever and ever and did not know how to go about doing it. And God just began to line things up. I interviewed several radio stations before I decided to go with this radio station. And I, I was I was terrified. I was supposed to do the first broadcast on June 6th. I was terrified to do it. But God strengthened me and gave me the courage because I know that there's something on the inside of me that God has placed there for other people. And it's not mine to keep to myself. It is the blessing and the glory of God that I do this. And I'm honored and excited that you all choose to join me because you could be doing anything else with your time. Uh, I thank God that you are here and I want to pray a blessing over you today. God, we thank you. We love you. We bless you, God. We thank you that you make room for our gifts, Lord God. We thank you that you place gifts on the inside of us, Lord God, before we will form God. We thank you, Lord God, that you will send for us no matter if we're in deep, dark places, God. God, we thank you that you will cause men to bless us, Lord God, and blessing indeed, God. We thank you, Lord God, that you're the God who, the God of promotion, that it does not come from the north, south, east, or west, but it comes from you from above. And so we bless you. We thank you now, God. We thank you, God, for bringing us to a place that we have to go down in the valleys of our lives, God, and make decisions, Lord God. We thank you that you created us to be strategic and progressive, God. And we bless you and we honor you. We trust you and we give your name glory. God, thank you for the pit stop. Thank you for the place of power influence and transformation. Thank you that you are the great transformer. We love you and we bless you. Join me here again on next Thursday at 5 p.m. at the pit stop on 108 Praise Radio. Invite somebody else to download the app and listen in. If you are in a local commuting area, join me at Macedonia Baptist Church, where I serve as a senior pastor. Macedonia Baptist Church is located at 1052 Barton Street in Conyers, Georgia. Our service time is 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. We begin with corporate prayer at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings and service starts at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. That address again is 1052 Barton Street in Conyers, Georgia. If you are a female, join me on Mondays at 8 p.m. on Facebook Live. You can find me on Facebook and, and send me a friend request at Billy Boyd Cox. Billy with an I-E, Boyd Cox. You can find me on Instagram at Dr. Billy Boyd Cox. And you can also find me um, it, on, when you find me on Facebook, I'll send you an invite that you can join Reset Your Life. Reset Your Life is a broadcast that I do on Facebook Live on Mondays. It's only for women and it is completely different from what I talk about here in the pit stop. So ladies, if you are listening, um, go friend me on and follow me on Facebook, Billy Boyd Cox, and I will uh, send you an invite to join Reset Your Life. And you accept that and you're able to listen in on Monday night, go back through some of the broadcasts and listen to 
mention the others that I've done on Facebook Live. I look forward to our time together on next week. God bless you. Go in the peace and the strength and the power of the Lord, knowing that you are fearfully and wonderfully made and God is not done with you yet, that there is still hope, that there's still goodness and, and mercy that abounds for you and that God has a plan. He has not left you alone. It might look dark and dingy and dirty and weary and dry, but I promise you, if you keep looking forward, if you keep, if you be still for a minute and reflect on some things that God will turn your whole circumstance around. God bless you. This has been The Pit Stop and I'm your host, Dr. Billy Boyd Cox. Thursday, everybody. Thank you for pulling into the pit stop this afternoon. The pit stop is the place of power, influence, and transformation. I'm your host, Dr. Billy Boyd Cox, and we're in for an exciting time on today. I'm just excited to share with you what the Lord has given for us as we continue to talk about license to dream, but we'll have a different topic on today, but I'm glad that you're here. I look forward to our Thursday afternoons together, and I pray that you were blessed from last week's uh, uh, broadcast of the pit stop and this week will be no less. I'm delighted that you are here. We know that when you come to the pit stop, if you've ever been to a racetrack, that cars pull into the pit stop when they have issues. And so